Hi there. The title of my talk is Your Illusory Self. Now, how well do you know yourself? Well enough to know that your self does not exist? Please let me explain. I'm a firm believer in a form of therapy and self-help known as self-illusion therapy. This form of therapy was developed by a wonderful Australian psychologist, Jim McLean, who sadly is now deceased. He was one of Australia's most experienced and respected drug and alcohol counsellors and addiction psychologists. He worked in that field for some 40 years and he helped literally thousands of alcoholics, other addicts, and persons with obsessional behavior to overcome their various addictions and obsessions using self-illusion therapy. Self-illusion therapy can help you overcome and master your problems, and not just addictions. Actually, we are all addicted to something or someone and generally, we're addicted to several things. One of the things we are addicted to in our Western society is the whole notion of self. Now, what am I now what I'm going to say now is extremely important. It is this self is an illusion in a very special sense. When you truly understand what this means, you will be free from the bondage of self in all its myriad manifestations. The basic idea of self-illusion therapy is that self cannot change self because self, which in any event is simply a mental idea or image in our mind of the person we supposedly are or think we are, self is the problem and no effort of the self can remove the self from the center of its own endeavor. There is no one self within our mind. There are literally hundreds and thousands of selves in our mind. They wax and wane from one moment to the next, although some are quite persistent over time, forming part of our personality. But all these selves are illusory. Now, when I use the word illusory in this context, that does not mean that these selves don't exist. They do exist as images in our mind. To call them illusory simply means that they have no separate, independent, permanent existence apart from the person each one of us is. Furthermore, these selves have absolutely no substance or power in and of themselves whatsoever. They are, as I've said, only images. Mental images are not visual ones, by the way. Images that we feel. Yes, they are felt images. Images of our sense of what is. Some may be true and some are false, but they're all felt images. For example, I am inferior to others, you may think and feel. I am useless, you may think and feel. Now, once a person really understands this idea, of self as illusion, they can begin the process known as letting go of self. The end result, freedom from bondage, happiness, peace of mind, serenity, improved relationships, and much, much more. The idea that there is no actual self at the center of our conscious and even unconscious awareness comes as a great shock to many, except to Buddhists 
who rightly assert not a doctrine of no self, but the fact of not self, anatta, and to various metaphysicians who also understand this concept that self is illusion. It's also the view that self is illusion that is held by most psychiatrists, neuropsychiatrists and neuroscientists. The truth is our consciousness goes through continuous fluctuations from one moment to the next. As such, there is nothing to constitute, let alone sustain, a separate transcendent eye structure or entity. True, we have a sense of continuity of self, but it's really an illusion. It has no substance in psychological reality. It is simply a mental construct composed of a continuous, ever-changing process or confluence of impermanent components. We could call them I moments, me moments. And these are cleverly synthesized by the mind in a way which appears to give them a singularity and a separate and independent existence and life of their own. The Scottish philosopher David Hume wrote that we tend to believe that the self is real and one because of what we perceive to be the felt smoothness of the transition which imagination effects between point and point. They're his words. The felt smoothness of the transition which imagination effects between point and point. But all that we are dealing with, he said, as have many others over the years, such as Nietzsche and Bertrand Russell, all we are dealing with is the bundle of experiences which have the illusion of continuity about them. The truth is that the self is not an independent thing separate from the various aggregates of which we are composed as persons. Indeed, every attempt to postulate or assert the existence of a self is self-defeating as it inevitably involves an element of self-identification. According to Buddhism, there are five such aggregates, form or matter, feeling or sensation, cognition or perception, volition or impulses, and consciousness, or discernment. In words attributed to the Buddha, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, manifest or subtle, as it actually is, this is not mine, this is not myself, this is not what I am. That quote comes from the Majima Nikaya. Buddhist scriptures are very firm on this teaching of not self, anatta. A quote from some other Buddhist scriptures, even as the word of chariot means that members join to frame a whole, so when the groups, that is the five aggregates to which I've referred, appear to view we use the phrase, a living being. In a very profound sense, the word chariot is but a mode of expression. Yes, a word for axles, wheels, chariot body, pole, and all the other constituent members placed in a certain relation to each other. When we come to examine the members one by one, we discover that in an absolute sense, there is no chariot. In exactly the same way, the words living entity and ego are but a mode of expression for the presence of the five aggregates to which I've referred. But when we come to examine the elements of being one by one, we discover that in the absolute sense, there is no living entity there to form a basis for such figments as I am or I. Having said all this, it is true 
that we do have a sense of mental continuity. So what actually gives us this sense of mental continuity? How does it arise? Bertrand Russell wrote that our sense of mental continuity is simply the result of habit and memory. Habit and memory. Each one of us is a person in our own right. I'm not denying that. However, the person each one of us is recognizes that there was yesterday and even before then a person whose thoughts, feelings and sensations we can remember today. And that person each one of us regards as ourself of yesterday and today and so on. Nevertheless, this self of yesterday consists of nothing more than certain mental occurrences which are later recognized, interpreted and regarded and more importantly remembered as part of the person which each one of us is who recollects those mental occurrences. Now let's get back to this supposed I and me. Actually, within each one of us, there are literally thousands of I's and me's. The I who wants to go to work today and the I who doesn't. The I who likes me and the I who doesn't like me. The I who wants to give up smoking and the I who doesn't. And so on. Vernon Howard, in his book, Esoteric Mind Power, writes about what he calls the self-divided man, who, he says, consists of dozens of selves which fight each other in taking him over for a few minutes at a time. Howard goes on to write, living in a state of psychic riot, he is thrilled one minute and dejected the next. One part of him is a danger to another part. So what can be trusted? Nothing. The self-knowing man has cleared his mental streets of these rioters, leaving him with a whole and healthy mind, which can be trusted completely. Think about it for a moment. How can the self change the self if self is fundamentally non-existent? It can't. End of story. I love what William Temple, a former Archbishop of Canterbury, had to say about the matter. I've already used these words, but I'll quote them again. He said, for the trouble is that we are self-centered and no effort of the self can remove the self from the center of its own endeavor. They're wonderful words. I'll repeat them. For the trouble is that we are self-centered and no effort of the self can remove the self from the center of its own endeavor. To do that, we need a power not oneself, a power not ourselves. Therefore, let us free ourselves from all forms and notions of self-identification, self-absorption, self-obsession and self-centeredness. Some of you may be familiar with the Zen koan about the goose in the bottle. The goose grew and grew until it couldn't get out of the bottle. The man didn't want to break the bottle or hurt the goose, but he did want to get the goose out of the bottle. So what did he do? Ponder on that one for a day or two, but please don't ask me for the supposed answer. Here's a simpler piece of Zen. A disciple asks, Master, what is myself? The master replies, Well, what would you want with a self? Indeed. Now, if we want to change, if we want change, positive change in our lives, we have to rely not upon self, which fundamentally is non-existent, but on a power not oneself, the power of not self. Your such power may well be different from my power not oneself. That doesn't really matter. As long as we realize that the so-called I, as J. Krishnamurti used to point out, 
is simply a habit, a word, a series of words, memories, and knowledge, which is the past. Note that, the past, the I and me of each one of us, and even the belief, naturally it's a misbelief, I am I, are simply brought about by thought, and thought is always a thing of the past. More and more psychologists, psychotherapists, and counsellors are drawing upon the insights of Buddhism to better understand the nature and activities of the human mind. In my own life, I apply quite eclectically and unashamedly ideas and teachings from a number of different traditions, both Eastern and Western. I guess I'm a pragmatist. I'm interested in results and changed lives. When we turn to Buddhism, we discover that its ideas, teachings and practices espouse a psychological realism that expressly acknowledges the reality of cognitive and other mental processes. The mind is seen as both relational and extended to situations in the external world. Yes, mentality belongs to the spatial, spatio-temporal world along with everything else, such that a person's mental things and processes are not wholly internal to that person. Buddhism views a person as being a human body-mind continuum, an autonomous and dynamic system that arises in dependence upon the natural world as well as human culture. So-called consciousness, not so much an entity in its own right, but a dynamic, ever-changing process, emerges when the mind and the body cohere. The physical body is essential for the emergence of the mental, but having said that, Buddhism has never regarded the body and the mind as separate things. Mind is said to extend into the body, with the body also extending into the mind. When Buddhism uses the word illusion, as I have used it throughout this talk, it does so in a very special way. I'll say it again, referring to a thing as an illusion does not mean that the thing does not exist. It means simply that the thing in question has no separate, independent, unchangeable, permanent existence. Buddhist psychology aims to treat what Buddhism often calls an illusory or a false mind, a mind characterized and dominated by wandering oppositional and discriminatory thoughts, with a view to bringing into manifestation a true or pure mind, a mind that is not in opposition to itself. Buddhism and Buddhist psychology teaches the doctrine that self is illusion and that belief in the existence of some supposedly permanent and substantial self or soul is a delusion. There's no actual self at the center of our conscious and unconscious awareness. That self does not exist. At least it doesn't exist in the sense of possessing a separate, independent, unchangeable existence of its own. In words attributed to the Buddha, whether past, future or present, internal or external, manifest or subtle, as it actually is, this is not mine, this is not myself, this is not what I am. In a very profound sense, we die and are born or reborn from one moment to the next. And whence comes our sense of I-ness? To quote Robert Lester, author of the book Theravada Buddhism in Southeast Asia, Lester writes, the I-ness or selfhood of man perceived as unchanging, his sense of individual being in time, having experiences as an unwarranted extension or assumption from experience to experiencer, from knowledge to knower, thought to thinker. No wonder Jesus exclaimed, I of myself can do nothing. John 5 verse 30. Perhaps 
he too understood the illusory nature of the self. So what is the mind? What is the mind? Well, for starters, it is much more than the brain. The materialist position, the classical materialist position that equates mind and brain is wrong. The bulk and the weight of the evidence point the other way, namely that the mind is both relational and extended to situations in the external world. But what of the self? Does it too have a transcendent, transcendental separate existence of its own? The short answer to that last question is no. That is the position asserted by most forms of Buddhism and it is a position that increasingly is being supported by the findings of modern neuroscience and neuropsychiatry. Hundreds and thousands of separate, ever-changing, ever so transient mental occurrences, those little selves, those false selves that I've mentioned, they harden into a mental construct. And we call it, that mental construct, the self, myself. But the so-called self is no more than a confluence of impermanent components, I moments, mental states. And they're cleverly synthesized, as I said, by our mind in a way that appears to give them a singularity and a separate independent existence of their own. But our so-called ego self has no separate, independent, permanent existence. Now, it is through this perception of an internally created sense of self that we experience, process and interpret the world around us, as well as our own internal reality. With alcoholics and other addicts, this false or illusory sense of self sadly becomes chemically altered, seemingly for all time with truly disastrous consequences for the alcoholic or addict and those associated with them. Each of us, not just the alcoholic or other addict, clings to this self as self. We even manage to convince ourselves that we belong to that self and that we are those myriads of eyes and me's that make up our waxing and waning consciousness. Yes, the so-called self is nothing more than an aggregate or heap of perceptions and sensations. It is in reality a non-self. There is no unifying consciousness, no ultimate self. The human mind is a field, a veritable battleground of conflicting tendencies, feelings and emotions for the simple reason that the mental is not a unitary agent. Consistent with an overall pluralism, we are always dealing with a plurality, you, you know, a pluralism of complex interacting and otherwise waxing and waning forces. That is the nature of reality. At the same time, Buddhism, as I've said, espouses an extended view of the mind, such that the mind is seen to be much more than just the activity of the brain. The mind is an embodied and relational process. The mind is a product of the brain, but it is conditioned by both internal and external events. I go so far as to say this. Most of our problems, at least those of a mental and emotional character, as well as problems in our relationships with other people, arise because we fail to recognize the illusory nature of our self of these hundreds and thousands of little selves felt images, felt thoughts in our minds. We fail to recognize the illusory nature of this. We constantly talk about our self. We become obsessed with our self. We're told all the time that we must love our self. And we react badly when we feel that some other person is attacking our self. If only we could grasp this simple truth, this ultimate reality, more than half of our problems would die from attrition. If only we, we, that is the person, the person 
that each one of us is, acknowledges that self is illusion. Please know this. You are not a self. You are a person among persons. Be confident, but forget all about self-confidence. Be a person of esteem, for that's what you are. But forget all about self-esteem. Seek the truth, that is the real, the actual, in all things. But forget altogether about self-seeking. The little me purposes of the so-called self are in direct and stark contradiction to the pursuit of happiness, peace of mind and serenity.